Let's pray once more. Father, as we open your word, we know that your word is timeless. We know that it's always relevant because it is timeless. We know that it it can touch corners of our lives that are unpredictable. We thank you for the way that your spirit never draws attention to himself, always comes to throw the spotlight on Jesus, always to make Jesus prominent. We thank you for the way that your spirit indwells your people, those who are trusting Christ as their savior. And for the way that your spirit, Lord, opens our understanding to see what you are saying. And so we pray, Lord, in a very difficult set of chapters that we arrive at today, that you will do that. Help us to see what you make plain. In Jesus' name, amen. One of the toughest things that we try to do frequently, but um, fail at frequently, is to predict tomorrow. So can you tell me what's going to happen tomorrow with 100% accuracy? I love the laugh. No, not really. We, we can guess at what the gas price is going to be because it's Monday and it's going up, right? For the commuters headed south. But how much is it going up exactly? We don't know. We can look at our weather apps and, you know, mine actually tells me by the hour what might happen in my locality. How do they know Pefferlaw? But even there... They're predicting tomorrow, tomorrow's weather with 40% chance, 60%, right? They buffer it. They're hedging their bets. They can't really tell you 100% what's going to happen tomorrow, right? The problem about predicting the future is we can't. <laughs> we, we just can't. We're human. We're time-bound. We can't see past now. Ask me what's next. I could guess. I can't see what's coming. We just, the the best guess is really the best we can do. Our youngest son goes to school in the States, as all of you know. And so the the exchange rate between the U.S. dollar and the Canadian dollar is of intense interest to us. It really is, right? A shift of one penny in that exchange rate, and we can either lose a lot, Or gain a lot. It can either be really costly or really effective to be on this side of the border. Um, The challenge is that we can only see back in time at what has been trending. And so to, to try to guess the ideal moment of when to exchange those dollars is a best guess based on those trends. The future for all of us is really... Just a guess. Not knowing what's next makes us vulnerable, doesn't it? We're just bound to right now. And in a country that's drifting far and fast from God, in a world that's convulsing and getting more and more restless and darker by the day, um, we keep asking, what's next? What is next? We read our news feeds and wonder, Lord, where are you in what's next? Hmm. How is it that believers are going to be able to thrive the darker it gets? How is it that when you and I place our trust in Jesus Christ, things could actually get worse, not better, on the surface? Well, that's, it's, that's such a big question, isn't it? As the world trends worse, and the Bible says it will, where's God in that? Really important question. Aren't you thankful that God isn't hampered by our time-bound vulnerabilities? Boy, I am. He's not like us. The God of Daniel, that's where we've been, for weeks at a time now, six, seven weeks, something like that. The God of Daniel is your God and mine, I trust. 
He can not only predict the future, he controls it. That's what my Bible says. He not only predicts it, he controls it. The God, God is the ancient of days. What does that mean? He's eternal. He's not bound by time. He can see on the other side of now, like all of tomorrow's are right now for him. And he's in perfect control of it because he doesn't just know everything. He's all powerful as well. He's sovereign over it all. So here's the phrase I want you to see and resonate with today. God is cognizant of and in complete control over what's next. Would you read that off the screen together? Go. God is cognizant of and the king in complete control over everything. He knows it all. He controls it all as well. And so as we've been learning through the first six chapters of Daniel, God really is the king of everything. The king of everything. That's key to keep in mind as we turn to chapters seven and eight. You're probably already there. Chapter seven begins on page 744 of your pew Bible. These two cha chapters are exceedingly challenging. Daniel chapter seven. In fact, the two chapters uh, comprise about 55 verses. If we were just to read all the verses, it would take up most of our time that I have to, to preach this morning. And so that's not the approach that we're gonna take this morning. Instead, they are important, all the verses are, but my goal is to picture what's there. Just to picture what's there in those two chapters and then to summarize them and to point out what's most important. I think that'll be fairly straightforward. To picture, summarize, and point out what's most important. So that when you return to read these verses, you can be confident. Confident that what you see here is what God intends to be here. And you see it plain as day. And that this gives you confident, confidence that what's in what's next, God is in complete control of. We're right on schedule in what's next. God is cognizant of and in complete control over, the king in complete control over what's next. Would you say that one more time? God is cognizant of and the king in complete control over what's next. Now, Daniel chapter 7 marks a hinge point in the book of 12, of 12 chapters. The first half of Daniel's chapter 1 through 6 recounts the past. It's history. The last six chapters of Daniel 7 through 12 recounts, previews, the future. There it is. This is the hinge point. So in the past, over the past six chapters, we've seen how four godly young exiles far from home, Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, ripped away from their home, ripped away from their countries, their country, but they stay anchored in God as they try to thrive in godless Babylon. Now those stories in the first six chapters come in chronological order like we'd expect. They span about 70 years. From the time that Daniel is about 16, 15, 16 years old till he's in his 80s, those six chapters run. He's about 82 when he's in the lion's den. You ever pictured grizzly, white-haired guy, grizzly, unshaved, white-haired guy in the, in the lion's den? But that's what it is. He's, he's in his 80s, right? Hmm. Um, these six chapters coming up, 7 through 12, Actually, those six chapters help us understand the next six chapters coming, right? They help us understand the second half of Daniel, which previews the future. And of course, you and I know by now the common the thread, the common theme that, that goes through the chronology of history and through the previews of the history coming is that God is king over everything. Would you say that again? Go. God do you believe it? God is king over everything. So 
Daniel chapter 7, verse 1, actually takes us a few steps back in the timeline, back in the chronology. Back before Darius and the lion's den in chapter 6, back before Belshazzar's drunken party in, in, and the fall of Babylon in chapter 5. Look at verse 1 of chapter 7. It takes us back to the first year of Belshazzar. Now we're two kings back from where we were, right? The first year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon. So, in the timeline of history, in the chronology, we're 14 years before Belshazzar throws his party, before he sees the writing on the wall, before Babylon falls overnight. At that point, first year of the reign of Belshazzar, God gives Daniel two dreams. Well, the first one is recorded in chapter 7. The second one in chapter 8 comes two years after that chronologically, but the two dreams go together. These dreams are so overwhelming. You ever had a nightmare that, that drains you? I have. These are so overwhelming that he decides to write them down on some sticky notes to try to sort them out. In these dreams, Daniel, God gives Daniel two doses of the future. Future even to us, part of it. What's coming, God says, will one day be written up as ancient history, but it's a nightmare to Daniel, and it hits him like a Mack truck. Look at the last verse of chapter 7. How, would, how does he respond there to what he dreams the first time? The first dream greatly alarms him. Do you see that? It drains him physically. He's, he's left pale. His color changed. But he keeps it to himself. He keeps it private. And then jump down to the last verse of chapter 8 after the second dream. The second dream leaves him overcome. See it? Sick for some days. Appalled. And trying unsuccessfully to understand it. Now those last Few words in that last verse of chapter 8 are pretty important for us. He did not understand it. That's a really important caution for us. You know, when we try to make sense of prophecy, um, it's important to say prophecy is important. Yes? Yes, it is. It's, in, it's all through our Bibles. Prophecy is important, but le so let's not ignore it or dismiss it. But prophecy is not easy. And so we dare not trifle with it or toy with it. What am I saying? Well, we know of preachers and teachers that go all across the map and they're teaching about the end times. Some downplay it, doesn't matter. Those parts of the Bible don't matter. Well, no, that's a mistake to downplay it so it doesn't matter. On the other side of the spectrum, the other mistake is to overplay it, to try to identify every little current event in the, prof in the prophetical timeline is a fixation on it, and we dare not overplay it either. And so we're going to stick to the text. We're going to stick to what God gave to Daniel in these dreams. We'll not downplay them, downplay them, and we're not going to overplay them either. So for us to sort out what was tough for even Daniel to figure out, don't lose sight of that, he couldn't understand it, even with some help, some explanation from Gabriel in the chapter. It, he couldn't understand it. So what was tough for him is likely to get us into some deep weeds too, eh? What's going to help us to stay out of the tall weeds? Notice this pattern. First, we're told the dream, and then Daniel looks for help with an explanation, an interpretation. What does it mean? And then it moves on to the most helpful thing in helping keeping us out of the, out of the weeds. It goes to the point. What's the point of all this? What is the point? How does this end? 
The point in, of these dreams for both chapters is found in chapter 7, verses 9 and 10, verses 13 and 14, and in verse 27, the very verses that were read aloud to us this morning from Scripture. That's the point of both dreams, both chapters, that we dare not miss. So here's a challenge. Are you ready? Get your finger, plant it on those verses right now. Because if in what happens in the next 10 or 15 minutes loses you, I hope it doesn't. If you get lost in the tall weeds, and that would be my fault, right? We'll find each other back here. All right? So that's where we're headed back again. That's the point of all of it. All right? I always hated hikes where we sort of, you know, some of us scampered off our own ways and got lost. So at least you have a bit of a guide. Everybody gather here when it's all done. Here's the point. This is where it's all going. So let's ask, what did Daniel dream? Well, from verse 2, chapter 7, on, let me summarize, and you just skim with your eyes. We are given a surreal scene. It's a dream. It's a vision. The four winds of heaven, can you picture that? Are stirring up a great sea. God is churning up the sea of humanity like frothy waves. Whenever you see the great sea, it symbolizes usually in the Old Testament the sea of nations, the sea of, of people that are against God, right? Churning up against God. And that's what's being churned up here. And verse three, out of that sea, what happens? Four great beasts come up out of that sea, all four different from each other. These beasts look like strange hybrids of animals that are familiar to us. Familiar animals, strange mix. So, they picture human empires that come and go. Human powerhouse nations that take each other down. First, there's a winged lion. That's pictured in, in, in the verses there, in the description of his dream. Next comes a lopsided, ravenous bear with three ribs hanging out of his jaws. Next comes a four-headed, four-winged leopard. Do you see that? It's a mix, hybrids of animals that we know, that we're familiar with. Each of them is overtaken and devoured by the next until the fourth hideous monster. Like no animal we know, there's a difference now, like no animal that we're familiar with shows up in verse 7. Do you see that verse 7? That beast, Daniel's description there, you see the words, is terrifying. It's dreadful. It's exceedingly strong. Here's the first brief description. Lots of the details will keep coming back at us throughout the two chapters. With its large iron teeth, it crushes and devours its victims. Picture of a metal cruncher. It tramples what's left underfoot. It has no mercy. It's a monstrosity with ten horns. One of the horns sprouts small, busts three of the other horns off, and then bloats with power. This beast, this final, fourth and final beast, here's where it gets weird, has human eyes. Now, this monstrosity, a mix of animal-like features that we, we don't know, unfamiliar to us, now gets mixed with human-like features. And if you're dreaming this, this is what terrifies Daniel the most. Human eyes, intelligence, a big mouth, arrogance. That mix of human traits, traits on a beast is what makes Daniel shake in his boots. I'm guessing that that pictured on the screen is nothing compared to what Daniel felt, compared to what Daniel saw. 
that left him feeling sick, drained. This beast-like human, this human-like beast is brilliant, he's overwhelming, and he's arrogant like none other before him. He keeps resurfacing, resurging through these verses just like they do, like happens in nightmares, okay? The dream that, get, that God gave Daniel in chapter 7, you can see it in pictures there, is meant to overlap, this will help you, with the dream of the statue that God gave King Nebuchadnezzar in chapter 2. Remember that dream? It was a statue of a man, nothing terrifying about it. It was a multi-metal statue, gold progressing down to a mix of clay and iron, right, at the feet. Clues in both of these chapters, chapter 2, chapter 7, and 8, show that these dreams, Daniel's here, Nebuchadnezzar's there, point to the very same string of empires that would come down through history. So the statue and these four beasts predict the same thing in different ways. They predict, ready? How God Most High will roll out history right to the end. Not just the end of this era of history, the end, the end. Okay, would you say that off the screen? Go. How God Most High will roll out history right to the end. That's what these dreams are all about. Don't miss it. They're previews of the powerhouse empires before they even came marching in time. Only Nebuchadnezzar was on the scene when Daniel heard about his dream in chapter 2. Only only that one had started. Everything was still future. And so God has pictured, here they go, uh, two years. In fact, these two dreams, I want you to notice something. When you read through the book of Daniel, you think that it's all about dreams. All about dreams. But I want you to notice something. There's only three dreams in these three chapters. Chapter 2, chapter 7, and 8. And these two dreams, chapter 2 and chapter 7, come 50 years apart. The first one, when Daniel's about 18, during the reign of Nebuchadnezzar, and the second one, when he's about 67. So dreams aren't as prevalent. They're out of the ordinary. They're unique. You need to understand that. What what did these dreams mean? Well, first, Babylon comes along, right? The winged lion, that was Nebuchadnezzar and his successors. He would be swallowed up by Media Persia, the ravenous bear, lopsided bear, right? That was Darius, the guy that threw Daniel into the lion's den, and his successors. And that empire would be smithereened by you know who's next, Greece. You know who was leading Greece at that time? The four-winged, four-headed leopard? Alexander the Great. So I want you to notice something. What God allowed Daniel to to see in his dreams were these animal mixes that were really accurate descriptions of the empires. I'll just give you an example. Why the four-headed, four-winged leopard? Why, how does that represent Greece or Alexander the Great, the, the, the Great? Alexander gained his throne when he was 20 years old. You guys have missed it. You're older than 20. Sorry. 20 years old, you call him emperor. Within 10 years, he had absolutely plundered everything that was part of the Medo-Persian Empire, and he wanted to go as far as China. He was, let's go! He was 30 years old when his soldiers finally said, no, nah. <laughs> Mm, I'm done. I'm done. His empire was vast. It just galloped and took things. No wonder a four-winged leopard. But what's the four heads? Well, he went back to Babylon, and at age 33, he was so disappointed. He had nothing more to vanquish that he just died. He was 33. He gave up. 
And that empire, the Greek empire, was divided into four generals, the four heads. And so you see, does God know what he's talking about? God is cognizant of and in complete control of what's next. Be confident, Christian. So you see it, but what comes next after that four-headed, four-winged monster? Well, that gives way to the iron-teethed monster, which at first seems to depict Rome. It's like at this point... um, the timeline of history does what only a a, a dream can do with it. It's kind of like the timeline folds on itself. Here's the timeline, and it kind of folds on itself so that it almost does a warp in time. It jumps to the future like only a dream can do, and you'll see why in a minute. And this monster merges with a greater global one way down in the distance to Daniel. Now, how does chapter eight figure in, right? We're just skimming, we're just picturing, we're just summarizing so that you get the whole point, right? That's, that's, that's where we're going. If we were to dip into chapter eight, we would see that that dream as well is meant to overlap with these. Do you see it? It's still talking about the powerhouse nations com- coming down in history ahead of Daniel's time. Now, the, that dream, though, focuses on the middle two beasts in Daniel's dream in chapter 7. Takes the ravenous bear and the four-headed leopard, and it shifts them to a ram that gets battered by a longhorn goat. Alexander the Great is that speedy goat whose hooves hardly touch the ground, okay? You still get the description fits. So, but what you need to see as just a summary is that even there when you read through chapter eight, those two also give way like the beasts did in chapter seven to that hideous, multi-horned, arrogant monster. Throughout these chapters, verses detailing how this monstrosity trample on God's people um, create its heyday of, of, of cruelty and is then destroyed by God before the end comes, those details just keep coming back as you read through these dreams. Now let's pause for a second and put it all into perspective. I want you to see this. In Genesis chapter one, God made mankind, male, female, in his image. What did that mean? God created you and me to reflect him like nothing else on the face of the earth can. To reflect him and to rule for him. And God's intention was for us to rule over creation, to rule nations in ways that reflect his ways. To rule wisely. To rule with kindness to rule with justice and care. But when we tripped into sin, Genesis chapter three, our downfall turned us into beasts. The way that we rule God's earth. Proof positive, just look at the news. Are we beastly towards each other? Um, Look at the urban news. Are we beastly towards each other? We tend not to nurture each other. We tend not to care. We tend not to be kind. How often did you see during the pandemic the reminder on every business door, be kind? It's because we're beasts towards each other in our downfall, in sin. It all started with Cain murdering his own brother. God had warned him, sin is crouching at your door. It wants to devour you, and it sure did. It really took him down. Since then, nations have trampled on nations in the most inhumane, monstrous, and beastly ways. It makes you yearn for a different kind of king, doesn't it? It does for me. I long for the kind of king who is kind, 
who is full of faithfulness and gracious and is really and truly just. But don't forget, history has rolled out right on schedule the way God previewed it would. God is cognizant of and the king in complete control over what's next. It was true in Daniel's day. It's true in ours. And some of his plan is still rolling out. Most of what Daniel saw ahead of his time is ancient history for us. Alexander the Great, the Romans, It's ancient history for us, but what held Daniel's jaw aghast was the ten-horned monster, unlike any beast that had come before it. And I'll just give you a little mosaic of the verses that describe it. It speaks with arrogance against God. Chapter 7, verse 25, it tramples the whole earth. Chapter 7, verse 23, it subdues God's people. Chapter 7, verse 25. Chapter 8, 10 to 14. He desecrates the worship of God. Chapter 8, 23 to 25. He gains power by intrigue, by lying, by deceit. He's empowered by unhuman force and mounts an uprising. This is the worst part of it. Against, look at chapter 8, verse 25. He mounts an uprising, a global one, against the prince of princes. It's like that was the last straw for Daniel. Who is that? Well, that's King Jesus. That's the king. No wonder Daniel was left in such dread. No wonder these nightmares shook him and he just couldn't figure them out. 300 years after Daniel, a Roman emperor named Antiochus Epiphanes, I won't make you say it, the fourth What you need to see is that Epiphanes was a title he took to himself, which means God manifest. See what he was claiming? I'm God. God God just shows up, people, in a Roman emperor. He burst into history claiming to be God and ruled Israel with an iron-toothed arrogance and, and violence. He crept in with deceit and intrigue, and then he trampled on the truth by turning against the worship of God in the temple. He made it illegal for God's people to hold the daily sacrifice. This is 300 years after Daniel. And he desecrated the temple. You've heard of the abomination of desolation? He sacrificed pigs on the altar, in the worst and most unholy way. But that trampling only lasted a few years, and it wasn't close to coming global. Antiochus, though fueled by Satan, as God said he would be, was just a prototype, was just a preview of a far more brazen, exponentially worse, beast to come, the Antichrist, who's still to come, not just in the distant future to Daniel, but in the future still ahead to us. And he's to come to trample God's people. Look at chapter 8, verse 23, to trample on God's people globally. Now, we don't have time to go into this. That beast is more clearly detailed in our New Testament, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, Revelation 12 through 19. You could, you, I was gonna say you could read this at your leisure, but it wouldn't be leisure reading. It's, it's when you see it and you take it in, it's terrifying reading. He will dupe the whole world by defying God in the end times. Now, let me do a little pause here. Because some of you who are more familiar with end times teaching from your Bible will go, but wait, Steve, I thought that God's people don't have to go through the tribulation. I thought that God's people don't have to suffer God's wrath, and you're right. So let me give you a brief sketch of how this all fits. It's just a sketch. Next, what's next? The appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ, the rapture. First Thessalonians chapter four, he will show up in the air 
call his own in the blink of an eye to himself. Those who have trusted in him will meet the Lord in the air. That ushers in seven years of trouble. Trouble like tribulation. Like the earth has never seen yet. Three and a half years of trouble. Three and a half second years of great trouble when this monster shows up. Now, after the rapture, there will be people left that go, whoa, wait, who had heard the gospel, who know about Jesus, and they will turn to Jesus, even though they missed the first bus. It'll be those people that hold faithful, not just his, God's ethnic Jews, but those who trust in Jesus after the rapture will be the ones that this beast will be trampling on mercilessly. So now back to where we were. This is probably what hit Daniel's gut so hard. How can anybody go against God with such viciousness as that, how can anybody go against God's people like that? Well, he had had foretastes of it. He knew what it was like to stand tall and godly. Both Antiochus the Roman and the future Antichrist start small at first. Both are brilliant men. They, they gain their power through intrigue. Both are fueled by satanic power. Both destroy thousands. They prosper for a time. They persecute and kill God's people. Proud, blaspheming God. They are both ultimately destroyed. But not by human hands. By God. And so the prototype is history. The global one is still coming. It's as simple as that. That's what Daniel is telling us. That's what the Lord is telling us through Daniel this morning. All through man's long and inhumane history, godless, arrogant, satanically fueled rulers have put God's people in peril. We saw it in Daniel. Who put Daniel's friends in the fiery furnace? Well, Nebuchadnezzar did. Right? Who put Daniel in the lion's head? Darius did. Who threatened Esther and all of God's people, Haman? Who threatened the Jews in the 1940s? Hitler. Who threatened God's people in the gulags in the 1950s? Stalin. It's always been a beastly history against God. ISIS, it, it makes you yearn for a better king. It makes me long for a kingdom that's not like that. It makes you call out, Lord, where are you in what's next? That brings us to where you've been holding your finger to the point of it all. You ready for this? Daniel gives us the point. The whole beastly parade has been marching toward. Look at verse nine. As I looked, thrones were placed. Where are we? This scene. Thrones were placed. It looks like heaven. And the ancient of days, eternal God, not time bound, took his seat. The supreme court of the universe is seated. It's now in session. His clothing was white as snow. Can you picture that? Spotless. The hair of his head like pure wool, unblemished. His throne was fiery flames. This, everything about this ancient of days is holy, holy, holy. The thrones, its wheels were burning fire like a smelting furnace that purifies everything. Look at verse 10. A stream of fire issued and came out from before him. It's white hot justice flows like lava from that throne, from the ancient of days against every hint of evil, against every beastly thing that has ever happened in history. 
Now thousands, thousands served him, worshiped him, and 10,000 times 10,000 stood before him. The court sat in judgment. That's the point. The books were opened. What books? Revelation talks about the book of life. Our names written in the books. Everything we've ever done, said, recorded in the books. It's judgment day. The final judgment of every human being begins. It's a preview for us. It's ominous. But be sure it's coming as sure as Babylon came, as sure as Persia came, as Greece came, as sure as Roman, uh, Rome came. Holy God will one day call all of us to account. One day this final judgment will also be ancient history. That should come as both a caution, a warning, as well as as with a great deal of hope for all of us. Nobody will be able to find a loophole. There will be nobody who will have an appeal. There will be no way to overrule how God rules because he sees it all perfectly, justly. For some, that's going to be a dreadful day. For others, it's going to be hopeful. Why? It all depends on whether you're sheltered in Jesus, in that prince of princes, or not. Sheltered in God's sent rescue, Or not. So look at verses 11 and 12. Daniel can't believe that even in that courtroom, this monster, this beast, won't shut up. Do you see that? He continues his his barrage, his vile attack on God right there, but there too, he's destroyed and tossed into hellfire. What Daniel sees next expands the point. Look at verse 13. I saw in the night visions, and behold, With the clouds of heaven, there came one like a son of man. Would you read those words in yellow and gold there together? Who came? One like a son of man. Who's that? You know. Um, He came to the ancient of days, the eternal timeless father, and was presented before him. And to him, to the one like the son of man, was given what? Dominion and glory and a kingdom that all people, all nations, all languages should serve him, worship him. Him, his dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away and his kingdom, one that shall not be destroyed. You know, when in John chapter eight, you see how Jesus treated the woman that was caught in adultery? That should drop our jaw because he, with that kind of love and justice, will be ruling forever, forever. Highlight these verses in your Bible because that's what's next. Our yearning for a different kind of king and a different kind of kingdom is taking shape. Now, 160 years or so after Antiochus came, the prototype monster, after he came and desecrated temple worship in Jerusalem claiming to be God, who shows up? On the scene, Jesus Christ came claiming to be God. Only he could back it up. He could do and say the things that only God could do. And Jesus frequently called himself this, the Son of Man. That was one of Jesus' favorite titles for himself. Do you know what he was saying? 
I'm the one who will be giving all, given all authority, the one whom all nations will worship, who will dash God's enemies like pottery, whose kingdom of righteousness will stand forever. And the Jewish leaders in those days called that claim blasphemy. Oh, you're just making yourself out to be equal with God. Yes, he was. Yes, he was. They killed him for that only to find out that they couldn't keep him dead. That son of man is our sinless savior, a risen savior, a risen king. That son of man, also the son of God, will be the one who will set everything perfectly straight in the end. You know the name Nabil Qureshi? Have you heard of that name, Nabil Qureshi? Oh, you should. Next time you look for a good book to read, I want you to find this book that's, that's entitled Seeking Allah, Finding Jesus. Nabil Qureshi grew up in a family that loved him. It, he, he, he loved the religion of Islam that he grew up in. And he really had a heart to pursue Allah with all of his heart. And that pursuit of the truth led him, as the title of his book says, to find Jesus. He came to a point where he finally had to turn his back on his family that he loved so much. He wasn't a rebel. He turned his back on Islam in order to follow Jesus. Do you know when the penny dropped for Nabil? Do you know what made the big difference for him? He said, when he read through the Gospels, and saw how, often, saw how often Jesus called himself the son of man, it clicked for him. He realized what that title is. He said, Jesus is more than a mere man like I've been taught. Jesus is more than a prophet like I've been taught. He is the divine son of man who will one day soon judge the world. And that's when Nabil kneeled and trusted Jesus as his savior. He trusted Jesus as God's sent rescue for him. Nabil knew that one day all the beastly things done against man by man, will be judged, and the judge will be King Jesus, the Son of Man. Look at verse 26. His first judgment will be to toss the beast, but the court shall sit in judgment, and the beast's dominion shall be taken away to be consumed and destroyed to the end. And what's next? Verse 27. And the kingdom and the dominion and the greatness of the kingdoms under the whole heaven. Picture that. Every single nation on earth will be given to the people of the saints of the Most High. To those who are trusting and treasuring Jesus, our King, the Son of Man. His kingdom shall be an everlasting kingdom. And all dominions shall serve and obey him. So here's the point to the whole point. What is your relationship to Jesus right now? What is it? Assess it. Are you trusting him? Are you leaning into what God has done through him to rescue you from that final judgment? He's the king and the kingdom that we've been yearning for all along. And this preview of the end, for those who are trusting in Jesus, will just be the beginning of forever. It's the forever that we've all longed for. The mathematician John Lennox has put it this way. He's a Christian mathematician in Britain. He said this, God shut lions' mouths for Daniel... He did not do the same for his son. Jesus Christ, the perfect son of man in whom there was no personal sin, so loved us that he gave his life for our many sins. He, therefore, Jesus, the son of man, therefore, is alone worthy to take over all government and power 
to the eternal and immense relief and joy of the whole groaning creation. This, Lennox says, is the big story that alone makes sense of history. This is the what next, what's coming next, that alone makes, makes, makes any kind of sense of a history that's been so beastly, so inhumane, so drenched in blood, so unjust. So when you find yourself asking, God, where are you? Where, where is God and what's next? He has just shown you the picture-perfect preview of the end. That's the point. That's where this is all headed. The Son of Man, your personal Savior, I hope, trusting Him, your personal Savior will one day soon return from heaven to crush all hostility against God. It'll all be done. And those who cling to Him by faith, even to the point of death, will be a part of His forever kingdom. That's the point. That's what God has wanted you to hear this morning. So what's next? Pastor Bob read the passage this morning. We didn't plan that from Titus chapter 2. What's next? The glorious appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now let's go back to the very beginning of the dreams. You remember how it started? A churning sea, humanity frothing up against God. Now picture that sea and in the middle of that sea, there's a reef. There's a shallow reef. And that reef is the Lord Jesus Christ. You can either harbor yourself behind that reef, but if not, you'll find yourself shipwrecked on it. That's the point. Are you trusting him? Are you refuged in him? Are you harbored in him? Today's the day. Now's the time. Are you eagerly waiting for him? Yearning for that new king and kingdom. And here's another question. Can you trust him no matter how dark or stormy it gets? Let's pray. Father, we're so thankful for your word how we need this preview. We can lose hope, we can get anxious, we can be afraid, but Lord, thank you. And I pray for anyone here that has yet to trust you, Lord, as their savior, that they will do so now, that they'll simply say in their heart of hearts, save me, Jesus. I trust you to save me from myself, from my sin. And I pray, Lord, that those who are would find that this great reef in this churning ocean truly is the place to harbor. We love you so much, Lord. Amen.